nursing, caring single mother. She just loved life. Dana would help in any way she could. Is ruthlessly killed in her own home. There was a great deal of damage to her throat. It was a rather brutal attack. And it would have taken somebody very, very strong to have done that kind of damage. Leaving a family devastated. I cried every night. You just can't fathom it. You can't comprehend it. Police uncover a deadly obsession. She was being stalked by this guy. He had become violent. He was a heavy drug user. To expose a killer closer than expected. How was that possible? Someone that Dana was trying to help. That had to be a huge betrayal. Every time they looked at an obvious suspect, that person had an alibi. What I was told completely changed everything. That was quite a shock. I couldn't believe it. It was all a bunch of lies. Puyallup, Washington. A charming and peaceful town at the foot of Mount Rainier. The city of Puyallup is about 30 miles south of Seattle, six miles east of Tacoma. It's just a nice little town. It's a community, a lot of families, parks. It has a small town feel to it. There's a lot of small businesses. The downtown area is easily walkable. It's a terrific little community. The tranquility is shattered in August 2001 when police get a call from a worried couple who cannot reach their nanny, Dana Laskowski, even after several attempts to contact her. We got a call from Dana's employers that she hadn't shown up for work. Her employers assured us it was very unusual for Dana to not show up. An officer is sent to Dana's home to investigate and arrives at 11 a.m., three full hours after she was expected to arrive for work. The officer arrived, he knocked on the front, knocked on the back door, and found the back door ajar. He walked in the back door, walked through the kitchen, and through the house, and found an adult female who's deceased on the couch in the living room. Working off a general description, the officer identifies the victim as Dana Laskowski. The crime scene is secured until detectives from Puyallup PD arrive. When we found her on the couch, we her one arm is underneath her head. Her other arm is behind her back. She's twisted so that her waist is at an awkward angle. The awkward twist to her body is something that we don't normally see in a natural death scene. It just has a sense that it's a murder. We saw abrasions to the neck, and there was a small pool of blood at her mouth. We did see abrasions on her elbows and knees. The investigator's suspicions are confirmed. Dana was murdered. What it looked like was a strangulation that occurred on the couch. And then the offender simply left her in the position that we found her. Forensic technicians searched the living room for evidence. Primarily, the items that we collected were either hair or fibers and then extensively processed for fingerprints. When we were processing the carpet, we discovered blood trail or spatter of some sort. The locations of those were believed to be consistent with the struggle. Investigators continue their work throughout the rest of the home. It looked to me like the house had been ransacked. It had a feel that it had been searched where someone was looking for something. We discovered a basement window that had appeared to have been recently broken and it was possibly a point of entry. One of the first things we're going to wonder is, was the victim murdered by a burglar that broke into her house during the night? Or was the murderer somebody that she had invited over the house? As they wrap up their work at the scene, Detectives contact Dana's family to deliver the tragic news. My son phoned me, and I said, yeah, he says, he said, Dana's dead. That was it. I was pretty much in shock, and I said, tell me one more time, say what you said, because I, I didn't want to breathe. You can't imagine that, because, you know, there was no reason.
Born in 1965, Dina's childhood was filled with joy. She was the happiest kid in the world. So she just it was so easy. She just loved life. Dana was also creative, a special bond she shared with her father, Bill, an award-winning artist. She was always making things. Well, she was artistic, like me. I was interested in what I did and wanted to help, so we were close. Just being around her, you felt her energy. You felt her enthusiasm and her zest for living each moment. As she grew older, Dana developed a nurturing... She always wanted to have a daycare. In 1989, Dana met Sam and fell in love. The couple married quickly, but from the start, there were complications. She was having trouble getting pregnant. In 1993, after years of fertility treatments, Dana's wish of starting a family finally came true. She was so excited when she found out she was pregnant, because that's what she really wanted all her life. And it was a pretty exciting time. Dana's delight only grew when she discovered they were having triplets. She loved the kids, because then she could bake and she could make things and do art. She loved it, she really did. But by 2000, after 11 years of marriage, the stress of parenting took its toll on the relationship. Dana told me that she had moved and that they were separated. As a single mom, Dana worked hard to provide a good home for her triplets. Dana cared deeply about family, and especially for her troubled 17-year-old niece, Amanda, with whom she was very close. Dana would do anything for Amanda. Amanda loved Dana, because, you know, Dana was kind of this slashy, artistic-type person, and Amanda loved all that, too. Dana was a very kind, caring person, loved her family. Amanda was a frequent runaway, so Dana wanted to guide Amanda out of risky behavior, away from drugs, away from the runaway lifestyle. Amanda had a rough relationship with her parents, so would often turn to her favorite aunt. By all accounts, she was the kind of the cool aunt that you could go and actually tell the truth to about your problems. No judgment, just help. Dana soon became a surrogate mom to Amanda and her best friend, Emily Lauenborg. Food, showers, a warm place to stay, money. Dana would open her heart and her home to help in any way she could. She was a mentor and also a friend. Dana had an open door policy and would always welcome Amanda's friends to her home. She was very comfortable at her age being amongst teenagers as though they were her peers. Just everybody loved her. But now, all that is left is loss and unanswered questions. For us to lose Dana was so hard. Losing a child is probably the worst thing that could ever happen. And, uh, you know, she shouldn't have died before me. Who would want this loving and generous spirit dead? And why? This murder was very unusual. Right from the start, we had a lot of things that needed to be done in order to find the killer. Back with her ex-husband, Sam, who they learn has the triplet staying with him. As the ex-husband, Sam, is a person of interest and the first person we needed to look at. But we couldn't find him. The fact that he was missing, this is significant to us. We have to find him. Coming up, investigators uncover a dark obsession. He had kind of gotten fixated on her, and he didn't really take no for an answer. And alarming secrets. In the journal, it said 10 things I want to do before I die, and one of those 10 things was kill somebody and get away with it. Then point to a killer no one would ever suspect. I felt what he was telling me was not possible. You just can't comprehend that it's real. And the truth is finally revealed. That's about as close to a confession as you're gonna get. Police investigating the murder of mother of three, Dana Laskowski, are trying to track down her estranged husband, Sam, when suddenly they receive a surprise call. Sam actually reached out to the police to try to find out what had happened. Sam, it turned out he had taken his kids camping and away from his phone and away from contact. 
And so when he got back to civilization, he had all these messages that Dana was murdered. So we went up to interview Sam, Dana's ex. And so when we confirmed that Dana was murdered, Sam was upset. He would respond to all of our questions, but he's just not the kind of person that elaborates. As we were talking to Sam, we noticed he did have some abrasions on his knees, and that's unusual. We asked him about that, and he said they were from playing baseball. It was baseball season. Detectives pressed Sam about his feelings toward Dana. When asked about his relationship with Dana, Sam described it as they were estranged, but they co-parented their kids, and they've had arguments, but overall, they were trying to make it work. Sam and Dana just grew apart. When she moved away, she was so excited. I think it made her feel good about knowing that she could be independent, and I think that was important for her to be able to do that on her own. We just felt that Sam was mad at Dana for having relocated three hours away and had split the family and the hopes of having a family and a marriage were dashed and destroyed. Was that enough to push Sam over the edge and harm Dana? Based on the information that we had about her ending her time with her husband and being coming estranged, we thought Sam had possibly come over to discuss something that has to do with custody. And then Sam, where he was the night of Dana's murder. Sam said that he had left his kids at his home and he went and got gas. He showed us a receipt for that gas. He said the next day he went camping with the triplets. Detectives believe Dana was killed sometime between midnight and 7 a.m. But Sam cannot corroborate where he was at that particular time. It wasn't an ironclad alibi. He didn't have three adults who would be able to say he was with us all night. They were kids, they were sleeping. It was not impossible for Sam to have left the kids and come back to Dana's house and committed the murder. And we looked at the possibility that he filled up his gas tank, drove to Puyallup, killed Dana, and then drove back to the kids at the home. Investigators pressed Sam further. Sam denied killing Dana. When we approached Sam for his fingerprints and his DNA, he was not necessarily agreeable or cooperative, didn't like the idea that he was a potential suspect. He certainly didn't like the idea that we thought that he might be responsible for her murder. Sam didn't really want to cooperate with requests for DNA and hair samples. Sam's behavior may be suspicious, but police have no concrete evidence to tie him to the murder. You can't charge someone with a crime just because their alibi isn't ironclad. You, you can't charge them with a crime because they can't prove they were someplace else. You have to prove that they committed that crime. There has to be evidence at the scene that connects the person to the crime. And so in this particular case, they didn't have that with Sam. While police seek hard evidence against Sam, Dana's autopsy results come in. The results were that she had died of strangulation. The cause of death was a fracture of the cracoid cartilage in her throat. There was a great deal of damage to her throat, her windpipe, and it would have taken somebody very, very strong to have done that kind of damage. We were going to be looking for an offender who had upper body strength and prone to flying into a rage because of the fracture of the cracoid cartilage takes a great deal of strength. And the strangulation itself takes a very committed attack victim generally fights back and then the attacker has to double down on the strangulation while the victim is struggling back just to think that dana struggled and fought for her life it's just wrong it's all wrong looking for new leads detectives turn to dana's niece police contacted amanda as she was a relative somebody who knew the victim and what Amanda said was that Dana was the kind of person where she could go over, do laundry, maybe get a little more. Who would want to murder her aunt? Detectives also speak to the couple who employed Dana as a nanny. When asked if they knew of anyone who might want to harm Dana, their answer is chilling. Dana's employers told us that Dana was being stalked by this guy. Her employers told us that Dana had said if anything happened to her, he'd be the one. 
And that was significant to us because I'm looking for a killer. Police investigating the strangling of Dana Laskowski have been told that she was being harassed by a stalker. Could he be a killer? Dana's employers told us that Dana was afraid of Miss Patrick. Patrick was a guy that installed cable in Dana's area. He liked her. Dana had told her sister-in-law and her employer he had kind of gotten fixated on her. Dana, by accounts, let him know that she wasn't interested. Police learned that Patrick had been trying to contact Dana for over a month straight, and that his pursuit had become even more intense. Patrick was leaving notes and flowers on her back porch. He wrote some notes that were like poems. Then, the messages took a disturbing turn. Dana's friends told the investigators he left her a note letting her know that he had been observing her and seen her doing things inside her home that he wouldn't know unless he was observing her. Dana mentioned that she was concerned about someone possibly watching her. The thing that really concerned Dana was that it appeared that he had had her under surveillance. Dana had actually told a couple of people that if I ever turn up dead, Patrick did it. Investigators checked Dana's phone records, searching for any clues. The phone records indicated that Patrick had phoned Dana repeatedly. It wasn't just some guy who, you know, sent her a couple extra texts and then disappeared. This was somebody who was going beyond that, doing stalking type things that would be concerning in any context. When investigators look into Patrick further, they make an alarming discovery. Patrick was driving a white van. It was a ladder truck. We had neighbors that had identified a white van in the area around Dana's residence prior to the April. Matched the description that the neighbors had mentioned. Pretty much demanded that we look at him as a very real suspect in killing Dana. Did Patrick's obsession with Dana turn deadly? We immediately got a search warrant for his DNA, for his locker, for his vehicle. On September 2nd, detectives find Patrick at his home address. We served the search warrant on him. He was very belligerent, very uncooperative with us during the service of that search warrant. He didn't want to answer questions. He didn't want to let them in the house. He did the kind of things that you might expect somebody to do if they had, in fact, been stalking someone and had gotten caught doing that. Investigators bring Patrick down to the station where they tell him Dana has been murdered. His demeanor changed 180 degrees from being belligerent and confrontational to Dana is dead. He says, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I didn't kill her. Here, please take my DNA, search everything. I'm not the one who killed her. Detectives ask Patrick where he was the night Dana was murdered. Patrick said that he was at work that evening. He then hung out with some friends and went to bed. Once given the information for his alibi, the investigators looked into it, and they were actually able to verify it. He had an alibi and could not have committed the murder. We also ruled out Patrick's ladder truck with the van the neighbors told us that they saw drive around Dana's residence. There was nothing in the service of the search warrant or in our investigation that indicated that Patrick wasn't being truthful with us. Given what he had done and the ways in which he had scared Dana prior to that, he's very lucky that his alibi could be confirmed. Having cleared Patrick, investigators now focus on another man in Dana's life, Michael, who they learned was having a long-distance relationship with her. Michael lived up in Canada, worked in the film industry. Dana met him when she was up in Canada visiting one of her friends. And they hit it off, and so they started to date. But he stayed in Vancouver, and she was down in Puyallup, and that's a several-hour drive from Puyallup to Canada. Friends tell police that their relationship was not without problems. They said Michael would party to the level of like a teenager, that he was at a certain level of partying that 
Dana didn't approve of. And so Dana was a little uncomfortable with that. There'd been a point where Dana had broken it off, but he was still interested, so they tried to make it work and get back together. But when detectives dig deeper, they learn Michael has a darker side. We were told that Michael was a biker, that he was a heavy drunk. Dana confessed to a friend that she'd had a one-night stand. And when Dana had that one-night stand, she was still in a relationship with Michael. Could this have been a motive for Michael to kill Dana? When we found out that Dana had a one-night stand, we looked at Michael as a potential suspect possibly murdering Dana out of revenge. Investigators searching for the killer of single mother Dana Lewkowski have a new possible suspect, her boyfriend Michael. Detectives want to know if an infidelity may have led to Dana's death. That caused us to believe that we had to rule him out as a person of interest. Michael lived in Canada, so we went up, and when we talked to Michael about Dana's death, it appeared to us that he was very emotionally overcome by it, that Dana was the love of his life, and that she had been taken out of his life, and that he was very seriously grieved. Michael also tells police he knew about the one-night stand, but had moved on. Detectives press him further. Michael told us that when he was on the phone with Dana on the night of her death, that she seemed a little guarded to him. He told her that he loved her, and then she didn't tell him back that she loved him, and he thought that was a little odd. He didn't like how the conversation ended. And that prompted him to want to get on the road and come down to see her and see if everything was okay. Michael claims he never made it to see Dana. He said he was stopped at the border, and he was turned away. He had some legal matter up in Canada that wasn't settled. And so he wasn't admitted. There was border crossing records that verified his alibi, that he did not cross the border. He got stopped by border patrol. And so he was able to show definitively that he was not anywhere near Puyallup at the time of Dana's murder. We didn't find the evidence to support that Michael had committed the murder. Michael is ruled out as a suspect. Police also determined the man Dana had a one night stand with was nowhere near her house on the night of the murder. At this point of the investigation, we just were really kind of at a dead end. I mean, there were all these people who would have been really good, solid suspects in any homicide investigation, but all of them had alibis, and all the alibis were verified. I was frustrated that the case wasn't moving forward, that it wasn't advancing. With the case at a standstill, detectives search for any detail they may have overlooked. Where Dana's ashes are inurned, there's a book and people can go and write their memoirs. The book has been left open for comments since Dana's funeral. If the perpetrator was someone who went to the funeral, and if the perpetrator was someone who's look at the book, one entry written over a month after the funeral grabs their attention. One of the memoirs that was written was written by Dana's niece, Amanda. And she said, I'm so sorry I wasn't a better niece for you. 34 days clean and sober, it's all for you. That was significant. There was something about the way that she'd written it that suggested it was a communication to Dana of remorse and to make amends for what had happened. And it was something that was significant enough to follow up on. Why did Amanda write that she had let Dana down? Detectives have a hunch that she may know more about her aunt's death than she's been letting on. That's it. That's the key. The key is the niece. I called Amanda in for an interview. When I asked her, what do you know? She said, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. With Dana gone, Amanda has been missing a mother figure, getting into trouble, and as detectives learn, spending time with a rough crowd. In the center of Puyallup downtown, we had Pioneer Park, and a lot of troubled teens would hang out there. The park kids called themselves the park rats. Amanda usually would be out around town in the middle of the night, hanging out with the park rats. Dana would often welcome Amanda's circle of friends into her own home. Could one of the park rats that Amanda knows have been somehow involved in Dana's death? And I talked to her about who of her friends would meet this profile of having 
for body strength, prone to flying into a rage. And Amanda said, well, it sounds like you're describing Blaine. She said Blaine actually attacked her on a couch, and it was a rather brutal attack. Blaine had come onto her, and that she had rejected him, and that he had become violent. Had Blaine tried the same thing on Dana, only for things to turn deadly? Blaine had been in Dana's house before, in some casual get-togethers, and possibly Dana would have rebuffed that advance, and that Blaine would be the kind to fly into a rage. Then, Amanda reveals something else. Amanda said that while we were processing her Auntie Dana's crime scene, she was across the street. She ran into Blaine there. She said that Blaine had scratches on his arms. When I get this information from Amanda, I look in to Blaine, and I find that he's got a violent past, and he has quite a criminal history. Police learn that Blaine's rap sheet is extensive and littered with drug and gun charges. I felt he was a very good person of interest in the murder of Dana Laskowski. But there's a big problem. Blaine's part of the United States. I wanted to bring him back to Washington to collect his DNA, to talk to him as a person of interest. But he was not cooperating. As investigators attempt to extradite Blaine, they seek out known criminals he's associated with and find one of them, a friend of Blaine's, serving time in jail. I sat down with him and I said, I'm looking at Blaine as being responsible for the murder of Amanda's aunt. He's got this upper body strength, he's prone to violence. And he looked at me and he said, Blaine didn't kill Amanda's aunt. What I was told completely changed everything. Detectives hunting the killer of Dana Laskowski have a new suspect, Blaine, the troubled friend of Dana's beloved niece, Amanda. With Blaine out of state, investigators grill his friend in jail, and what he tells them is explosive. So police suggested to him that maybe Blaine had been involved. The friend said, no, it's not Blaine, it's Emily. He said, Emily killed Amanda's aunt. It's a stunning allegation. 17-year-old Emily Lauenborg is Amanda's best friend and someone who Dana treated like a daughter. I felt what he was telling me was not possible because Dana always had an open door and was always welcoming to Emily. Police found out that a lot of times Amanda and Emily would show up at Dana's house. Dana was somebody that Emily could go to safely regardless of the circumstances. And Dana would take her in. So as you can imagine, that was quite a shock to the team. To confirm his story, investigators speak to other members of the Park Rats. Two of these kids told me, yes, Emily killed Amanda's aunt. Blaine didn't kill Amanda's aunt. Nobody doubts that Emily did it. Nobody. One of these individuals told us that Emily was doing a lot of drugs. Had Emily's reckless behavior somehow played a role in Dana's death? I was told that they all had nicknames for each other and that Emily's nickname was Mutant. The first nickname that we call her was the Mutant because she was stronger than any, of, any other girls that we knew. Everybody's scared. Your ass. Fuck yeah. She was tough. She would challenge them to wrestling. She would beat them in wrestling. She was very intense. And I was told she's able to choke people. She would wrap over her hip. And that was consistent with the body position that we found Dana Laskowski in. Twisted at the waist, one arm behind her back, and an injury to the neck. And so the initial thought that it can't be hurt was slowly replaced with maybe it could be her. She's intense, she's strong, and everybody seems to be kind of scared of her. Did Emily actually kill Dana? And if she did, what could be her motive for committing such a heinous crime? Investigators bring Emily in for an interview. I sat down with her and I had a tape recorder. And she said, aren't you gonna turn that thing on? I would say she was quite self-confident, a little cocky. She was not particularly cooperative with Chris to talk to her about what happened. I 
said, you know, here you are sitting in the police station under suspicion of murder, and you're playing this game with a detective. And I said, look at these people right here that have told us you killed her. And she said, those people are lying and that she didn't do it. She got very angry. Those people are lying. When investigators ask Emily where she was the night of the murder, she dodges the question. She was bartering and arguing with me and not really giving me a clear defense and denial. Officers obtain a warrant to search Emily's residence. One of the items that they recovered from Emily's apartment was a shirt that Emily had taken from Dana. One of her friends told us that Emily had a black shirt that belonged to Dana and that she actually wore that at Dana's funeral. We went back to the pictures of the funeral and did see that Emily was wearing a black shirt. One possible explanation for that was rubbing her nose in it. Not only did I kill you, but I'm wearing your blouse to your funeral. The search uncovers more incriminating evidence. And we found this journal. And in the journal, it said 10 things I want to do before I die. And one of those 10 things was kill somebody and get away with it. One of the statements in the journal that Emily wrote in her own hand when talking about Amanda, because she'd gotten into an argument with Amanda, was I could effing strangle that bitch just like her aunt. So that was very significant. I was invigorated because I had something. That's about as close to a confession as you're going to get. It is absolutely sufficient for me to take that to a jury and say, this is her admitting that she killed Dana Laskowski. On March 13th, 2003, Emily is charged with first. When you find out that such a young person could take a life, how is that possible? Someone that Dana was trying to help and care for, that had to be a huge betrayal. You just can't fathom it. You can't comprehend it. It's devastating. Though Emily is in custody, prosecutors know most of the evidence against her is circumstantial. So they circle back to Amanda. It became pretty clear that Amanda was going to be the key to solving this. We needed Amanda to crack, because absent that or a confession, there wouldn't have been enough to prove that Emily committed that crime. If Amanda did know what happened, why hadn't she told police? And why had she covered for her best friend? So I meet with Amanda and I said, listen, Amanda, you have led us on a wild goose chase. Starting off with Blaine, who was in another state. He didn't do this. You have not come forward with this right from the start. You know what? This is a case of conspiracy after the fact. So tell me what happened. That's when she really cried and sobbed. Police have charged local teen Emily Lauenborg with the murder of Dana Leskowski. Now, investigators suspect Emily's best friend, Amanda, Dana's own niece, may also be involved. I said, all right, tell me what happened. You've sent us on every possible goose chase and every rabbit trail you could head us down. It was all a bunch of lies. Through tears, Amanda makes a horrific revelation. Amanda disclosed that she and Emily came to Dana's house and they came to the back door. They were high on some drugs and they just went up to try to get some money. And Emily was rude and Dana said, you girls have to go. Things quickly escalate. Emily was being belligerent, and Dana touched Emily to kind of guide her out the door, and Emily just exploded into a, a rage or attack. Basically, she attacked her, put her in that wrestling hold, then squeezed too tight with some kind of scarf or fabric. Amanda said she turned around because she didn't want to watch what was happening. But she heard a crack, and she heard a gurgle. She heard Dana gasping for her life, and then she didn't hear anything. And that was because Dana was dead. And then they, they had 
that it was kind of an explosive situation that got out of control. They didn't go to the house to murder Dana. I was told that Emily had said that Amanda was always ditching her for her aunt. Emily, she was jealous of Dana. It's my opinion that the motive Emily had was to get Dana's influence out of Amanda's life. And Emily just went over there with the intention of getting Dana so mad at Amanda that Amanda wouldn't be welcome at Dana's anymore. And that Emily would have achieved what she wanted. And that the murder simply got out of control because of emotions and drugs. But why didn't Amanda come forward earlier to tell the truth about what happened that night? I asked her, why didn't you tell us right up front, right at the start? She said, because of my family, it's so bad now. What's it going to be like now when they find out? She wasn't involved in the murder, but she was involved because she was there at that time. And I don't know why she didn't do anything. It was upsetting and surprising to all of us. Prosecutors need Amanda's testimony to have any hope of convicting Emily for murder. Amanda agrees and will not face any charges herself. If she's charged with a crime, then she has the right to remain silent. She was the star witness for the case. If we had charged her criminally, we couldn't have called her as a witness. Despite the agreement, prosecutors fear Amanda won't keep her side of the deal. The biggest challenge for us, from a prosecution standpoint, was that setting aside Amanda's testimony, everything else was circumstantial. Wearing a blouse can be explained away. An angry journal entry can also be explained away. I think the only way that we could have been successful in front of a jury was to have Amanda take the stand. The problem was knowing exactly where Amanda's loyalties would be. She was very conflicted. And there was definitely a chance that Amanda could have taken the stand and said, I lied to the police when I said what I saw. And I didn't see any of that. I was very concerned that the jury was going to listen to this case and look at Emily and say, I just don't buy it. This is a case where had we taken it to a jury, all of those questions that had come up in the investigation, all the initial leads, all of the doubts that it could really have been Emily, all the alternate explanations were certainly enough that it could have been that a jury had decided that we just didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Prosecutors face a difficult choice. Risk Emily walking free after a jury trial or guarantee at least some jail time with a plea deal. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that we hold the killer responsible. Emily was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of manslaughter. After Dana's murder, Emily is formally sentenced. Emily was charged as an adult. Her sentence was just under seven years. Even though Emily is sent to prison, her sentence brings a mix of emotions. I felt a sense of relief that someone was now being held accountable for Dana's death, but I did feel angry. I thought, well, at least it's something, you know. But it just was amazing that you could take the life of a young mother and only at least six years. Doesn't make sense. Dana's family was upset that the sentence was so light. They felt that the person responsible for taking the life of Dana should have been given this two sentence. It was really tragic. And one of the things about the criminal justice system is it doesn't put things back the way they were. It just tries to hold people responsible so people can move forward. I cried every night. I think I must have cried for a year. I miss her tremendous amount. And um, I will think about her forever. I don't think we ever will get over the loss of something so tragic. I can't really say her family ever had closure because to them, the loss was the loss of Dana. A gavel dropping doesn't undo that loss. I miss her a lot. I think Dana would want to be remembered as a loving mother, a loving friend, and a loving child. All of the doubts that it could really have been, all the alternative explanations were certainly enough that it could have been that a jury had decided.